are pre-recorded and a film will be captioned on the website later. Uh, the signing is by Sarah Meeks and we did try for two signers but we couldn't get two so we've just got Sarah I'm afraid. We had a successful pre-launch in March which some of you came to and it's on the website. We launched Exploration 23 with a very limited response, I'm afraid, but one of the outstanding contributions came from 11-year-old Lucas Jackson, and Rich is now going to show him. It would mean so much to me if everybody understood that some things that are easy for them aren't easy for people like me. Please take a minute to stop, think, and try to see things from my point of view. Thank you. Autism. Thunder and lightning strike me again, making the thundering bulldozers in my eardrums get going that I can say. Whether it is people shouting, vehicles rumbling, or anything else ear-piercing, the bulldozers attack. Roses are red, violets are blue, but what co colour is autism? I have not a clue. Take me books, take me away to somewhere where it is silent, so I can be free on this treasure island. No smells of disgusting food or any weird artifacts that have the texture of strange. Just peaceful and relaxing with nothing to bother me. But no, this is Earth, a planet that does nothing but put pressure on you. When you go to the door, the planet has taken away your other shoe and you go to collect something that someone has told you to collect. It turns out that it is not even there. Why is the world targeting me? I, I haven't done anything wrong, have I? All I do is show off my talent for drawing and writing. That wouldn't even hurt an eye. For some reason, when I have a hug or take a break with a stretchy man, the world likes me again. Why is this? I will never know. World, when you do take a break, don't say I didn't tell you so. is Daniel Kabidi, <coughs> our General Secretary, who doesn't happen to be in the room at this moment. So we'll move on to Ellen Goody and Linda Jordan. Ellen is a self-advocate and a product of the inclusive education system, which her mother Linda was a pioneer in starting in Newham in the 80s. Linda was a teacher and now works for the National Development Team for Inclusion. Ellen. Picture. This is me in my flat. I think I've got some 
up. Independently, of course. <laughs> the bottom left hand corner picture is the one with the frames. Um, one of which is my best work friend, Jamila. Who was my PA for, for four years. He lived with me. Um, another one is called Sarah, Sarah Perger, who um, is also close. There's her PA, Hannah. So also a best friend. And Jade, who I was 18 with, and I met her through Lucy Mason. Oh. And Shirley is my second oldest friend from school. Second to school, in fact. The top right hand corner, has been working in the office, <coughs> doing that to me. And the bottom right hand corner is me performing in our local art centre called Strat Circus. Mm. Comedy. Comedy. <laughs> I've always had lots of best friends. Um, my friends are very important to me in my life. We all learn a lot together. We help each other out and look out for each other. Three of my friends, they don't even need to look at the paper for that, three of them were bridesmaids for my wedding. My social life has changed since I got married. My husband is Alan, who's sitting in the van in the front. Wow. <laughs> I see my friends together with Alan and sometimes on a girly night as well. That's it. That's your wedding. Thank you. This is my wedding. Picture of me and Alan. Thank you very much. Now we've got Linda. Um, you've heard from Ellen about uh, the fact that she went through mainstream schools um, and how that meant that she's always been part of the community, she's had friends um, and a great life, I think. That's what you said, isn't it? Yes. Um, that, that was possible because at that time in Newham, when, when Ellen was very young, um, we were in the middle of developing an inclusion policy, strategy, whatever you call it, um, and it, it was um, the right time I suppose, although I do believe it would be um, a little bit tricky now, but it would still be very doable, but we were, in Newham we were already pretty um, conscious that we needed to do a lot around race equality, sex equality, gay rights, etc. Um, and as a group of parents with young children who had the lots of labels, we, we worked together with our local authority to um, agree that we were going to close our special schools and all children would be able to go to their local schools. I draw the short straw out of our group and I stood for election in 1986 and went on the council and became chair of the education committee and um, had the privilege actually of working with probably hundreds of people over a few years to do a real sort of lot of stuff that meant that um, children were all going to their local schools apart from 
small numbers whose parents um, wanted them to go to special school or they moved into the borough and they were already at special schools. But the vast majority of children um, over time um, were able to go to their local schools. And people are always asking me now, you know, many, many decades later, how was it possible? Um, and I think that although it was, you know, perhaps a slightly less hostile environment back then, um, we, we, and I think it would still work today, we, we came at it very much in terms of a human rights perspective, based on eugenic ideas that were no longer acceptable, and that it was just morally wrong to segregate people on the basis of socially constructed labels. And unlike now, when the whole system is bogged down with bureaucracy and layers and layers and layers of stuff, um, it was just really nice to be able to cut to the bottom line and just say this is wrong. Um, and it, it was just about working with parents, thinking, getting them to dream about in an ideal world what would they want for their kids, talking to young people who said they wanted ordinary lives, etc. Um, and I suppose when I started off at, off at the journey as a parent, Ellen was very, very young, um, and people sometimes said things like, oh, but she won't get the right provision in a mainstream school. And my response was always, it actually doesn't matter to me whether Ellen learns to read and write. I want her to have friends and be part of her community and to be able to live in the real world. Um, and not surprisingly, what we discovered by kids going to their local schools was that actually it was great for everybody. Education for everybody improved. Um, the teachers had much more joy in their teaching because they were having to think about how to include everybody. Um, and we managed to break that barrier that um, you know, we no longer thought that if you were clever, you were more important. You know, we developed a culture whereby everybody was equal, equally important. Um, and what we learned was that through those, the years that children were going through mainstream education, that academic attainment, the golden, whatever it is, actually improved dramatically. And um, education attainment for all children increased. Um, and it's no surprise that that's because if you're a great teacher, in an inclusive environment, you are going to be a great teacher for all, all children. So, um, you know, what was going on in Ewan was actually part of a national movement, although perhaps a lot of authorities didn't make the progress we did. There was a, a definite drive um, towards inclusion, and obviously Richard and lots of other people probably here tonight have been part of that movement. Um, and it was quite exciting and, and I think we managed to sustain that progress over a number of years. But sadly, um, since this government's been in power, things have gone terribly wrong. They've obviously got an, an ideology which is about creating this hierarchy of importance and that um, so-called intelligence is a more important characteristic than emotional intelligence or all sorts of other gifts that people bring. Um, and it's been shocking for me, who gave a lot of time, you know, gladly and willingly, and as I said, it was a privilege to do it, for us to see the backwards movement since this government's been in power is shocking and, you know, utterly frustrating. And I work in the system still, and every day I just feel so depressed, but at the same optimistic, because I believe that we are... Um, at a place where we're so at the bottom, it can't really get much worse. And I think things are happening, which I won't go into, but I do get a sense nationally that, in general, people have had enough of the way things are going in this country. And, um, you know, there is, I think there will be a movement back to a more sensible... Um, but, you know, we've clearly got a government that really doesn't care, and they're only really interested in people that are rich and powerful and um, got loads of money. So just to, to finish, you know, inclusion will happen. Recently our comrades and colleagues and friends in Australia have launched a new 
massive policy change, which is about ending segregated schooling, ending segregated housing, and ending segregated employment. So, you know, what, what an amazing thing to have achieved. And, you know, it's a shame, and it's, a, it's just shocking, it's a scandal that our government has allowed our country to be, to be the sort of laughing stock of, of the international inclusion movement. We were the leaders, you know, we were, le we were the leaders in the 80s. Um, we're now in this shocking situation where we've got thousands of children out of school, thousands of children who don't want to go to school, um, and thousands of children having to be placed in special schools when that isn't what they would ever want and it's not what their parents really want. But as I said, I'm always an optimist and, you know, inclusion will happen. If we look at the state of the world now, I remember Marsha Forrest, who was one of the American pioneers of inclusion, once saying to me, Linda, this is part of the peace movement. And I think now more than ever we can see the importance of that, you know, trying to have movements which are about people being able to learn together, live together, share our common humanity. So um, we'll keep going, it will happen, it's the right thing. Thank you. Here. So we've now got a film by Dr. Mara Griffiths, who's from Leeds University. Okay, I'm talking to Miro Griffiths, and he'll introduce himself and tell you all about himself. Miro, over to you. Okay, thanks, Richard, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, to be here. So my name's Miro Griffiths. I'm based in in, in Liverpool, uh, and I probably come at this topic from multiple different angles really firstly i come at this as a disabled person who has spent many years engaged in campaigning and activism and developing a political consciousness around the subject of disability and understanding my identity as a disabled person through a political lens i also come at this from an academic point of view uh, so I'm a scholar in disability studies at the University of Leeds, and I'm also the co-director of the Centre for Disability Studies as well. And finally, I also come at this from an angle of engaging in policy making processes. So a lot of my uh, research and also my um, experience of trying to influence social organisation around disabled people's lives has been, a, has been a, focused on policy making processes and legislative frameworks. If I think about my kind of trajectory through all those spaces, what's been quite important, I think, is, is to be guided by the voice of politics. And often when I was growing up, I very rarely thought about my identity as a political subject and recognise that political consciousness that surrounds trying to make sense of what disability is, how it is to be described and how it is to be experienced. And also, most importantly, I suppose, is how to resist the experiences of disablement in everyday life. And that's extremely important because as you begin to make sense of your place in society, it is very easy to be dominated by that individual and medicalized narrative of assuming that you are the problem and that there is a desirability to conform to expectations, to normative practices, normative ideas of how you should exist and live your life and and be within the communities that you belong to through my disability politics activism i became aware that that narrative could be resisted and it had to be resisted it is essential to resist that narrative because then what you find is that you start to orientate your understanding of disability not to be trapped within yourself but to think about it in the way in which it is produced through social organization so as i became involved in campaigning and i did start often uh much of my early experiences of what i thought campaigning was was rooted in uh charity models and charity organizations that we would associate with being traditional disability organizations that do not represent the voices of disabled people or their interests so what i thought campaigning was was much aligned with that and it was only when I became exposed to the ideas of what I call now 
radical and incremental activists. And what by that I mean radical activists who are producing visions for alternative ways of organizing society, of producing accessibility and inclusivity that require a radical overhaul of the way society is organized, that require deep-rooted um, organizational change within politics, within economics, within social and cultural. I was also exposed to what I referred to in my writing and my research as incremental activism, which is associated with trying to negotiate spaces of opportunity within the existing configurations of, of society. And having that exposure to both allowed me to, first and foremost, recognize that an alternative is possible. You don't have to go on living that living that you are bla you are to blame yourself to to assume that your identity is undesirable as a disabled person and to recognize that the barriers that you experience are the fault of you and therefore you are responsible for that so resisting that allowed me then to think about well if it do, if i'm not to blame then where is the blame where is the emphasis of responsibility in in how disablement is being produced and sustained in society and that's what led me to a, a social model interpretation of uh, of disability and allowed me then to move away from these organizations and become much more focused on um, thinking about the role and the significance of disabled people's organizations. And by that, I think, you know, all of us in our audiences who are familiar with disability politics will know that that means organizations that are run and controlled and managed by disabled people. But so becoming more orientated with these organizations allowed me to recognize that my focus of resistance should be entrenched within political arrangements, economic arrangements, social, cultural, technological arrangements, and so on. This is where the focus of resistance should be should be um, placed. And then this allows us then to think about the alternative. What does it mean to produce accessible and inclusive societies? So allowing my voice to kind of flourish within those spaces was essential, not just to my own political consciousness, but also to the spaces that I wanted to belong to as well. I was supported by many activists, including yourself, Richard, to have a voice and to think about how my ideas, my articulations of what I wanted from society, what I wanted from my, my participation within the communities that I wanted to belong to, how they were important to not just myself, but important to the demands and agendas and strategies that we were trying to create and produce within our disability activism. And I think this, this brings me to a, a key point, really, which I want to make here in this talk, which is to recognize the importance of capturing young people's perspective within disability activism. It's not to, th it's not to think about how to establish a youth voice in inverted commas. It's more about thinking, how do the ideas and imaginings and creativities and the experimentations that young disabled people want to have and want to pursue within disability activism, how that can affect the things that we are doing as part of our main agendas or part of our main strategies. Often we trap young disabled people's voices in just being a youth perspective. And I think that that does a disservice really to what we are trying to achieve within disability activism, which is to think about how all of our ideas within the, the process of resistance and within the process of articulating an alternative vision for inclusive societies, how that can flourish because of the collaboration and ideas that come from different communities, whether that's youth groups, whether that's people from uh, ethnic communities, whether that's those who are bringing in the intersections of sexuality and disability. It's about allowing all voices to flourish and how all voices can influence the opportunities to produce and realize accessible and inclusive societies. My name is Meta Anwar Westander, and I'm the founder of Disabled Students UK, an advocacy group dedicated to spreading disabled students' insight into accessibility in higher education with the aim of improving policy. Let me do a quick sensory description. I'm a white young person with an accent that's a mix of Swedish, American, and British. I'm very excited to have been invited to speak at this important event about the current situation for disabled students in higher education and to situate this in its historical context. 
The proportion of higher education students who have declared a disability is steadily increasing, having doubled since 2010. Today, almost one in five students from the UK declare a disability. This increase is partially related to increased access to higher education and increased recognition of neurodiversity. However, it's also related to an increase in debilitating mental health conditions among young people. 5% of students now declare a mental health disability. As a disabled student myself, I have faced inaccessibility at university. In 2019, those of us who made up the Disabled Students Network at my old university created a report evidencing the issues experienced by disabled students there. Unfortunately, I was ultimately forced to drop out of this master's. However, the report became widely spread, and I started being contacted by disabled students at other universities. With time, it became clear to me that my experience of inaccessibility wasn't university-specific. Realizing this, I called a meeting with students from all over the UK, and together we created Disabled Students UK. DSUK quickly became the largest disabled student-led organization in the UK, with students from over 70 universities. The organization put lived experience and an evidence-based approach at the heart of our mission to improve accessibility. Our 2020 report, which warned the sector about the impact of the pandemic on disabled students, was mentioned in Parliament. Our 2022 report, Going Back is Not Choice, laid out five key lessons from the pandemic for how a university can become more accessible, and it was hailed as a potential game changer. We've spoken at the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Disability, at the Cambridge Union, and delivered the Advanced HE Conference keynote. Recognized for our data-driven and collaborative approach, DSUK has thrice been named one of the most influential disabled-led organizations in the UK, winning the category in 2023. Our organization stands on the shoulders of giants, basing our activism on the laws that were hard-earned by the historic UK disability rights movement. First, the Disability Discrimination Act in 1995, then the 2001 Senda, which extended these rights into higher education, and finally the 2020, 2010 Equality Act, which we rely on today. A turning point in our student activism came when we discovered the guidance produced by the Equality and Human Rights Commission on how the Equality Act applies to higher education. Before then, we had a sense that the treatment we were experiencing wasn't okay, but we didn't really understand our rights. When we found that guidance, suddenly we had a standard that we could hold universities against. Those rights are the legacy of many people in this room, something I'm incredibly grateful for. The progress made over the years has resulted in a new generation of disabled people. The next generation is majority neurodivergent and mentally ill. Most of us have what's sometimes called invisible disabilities. A good proportion of our community are also international students or second generation Brits. Because of our diversity, DSUK takes inspiration from the American disability justice movement as well in making interdependence and intersectionality core to our organizing. This also means being open to different ways of thinking. While DSUK as an organization holds on to disability as an identity, our community contains a rich diversity in how people identify. This year, DSUK conducted the largest survey of disabled students' experiences in higher education, with input from more than 1,300 disabled students. The project, the project named Access Insights found that on the one hand, the disability rights movement has resulted in big improvements for many disabled students. Of those students who had disclosed their disability to their university, 90% reported that they had the opportunity to speak with a disability advisor something that would have been unthinkable 25 years ago. At the same time, our survey results show that in many ways, the law is not being enforced. Despite the right to access their education on equal terms with their non-disabled peers, only 35% of our students actually state that they have the support and adjustments needed to do so. 
Taking strength from the rich history of the disability rights movement, DSUK is now looking toward the future. This year, we put together 10 year goals for the sector, built on six principles for the disabled student experience. We believe that disabled students should encounter universal design and an inclusive culture at their university, that their path to support should have as few barriers as possible and should lead students to have sufficient and effective adjustments, that students should have somewhere to turn when issues inevitably arise, and that they should have equal non-academic opportunities at universities, such as social and career opportunities. Let's focus in quickly on one of these principles, having sufficient adjustments. We know that disabled students should receive all reasonable adjustments needed to enable them to access the degree on equal terms with their non-disabled peers. In order for this to happen, disabled students need four things. To be told about different possible adjustments so that they know what to ask for. To have the adjustments they ask for agreed to have the agreed adjustments implemented, and finally, they need the implemented adjustments to be effective. Today, only 8% of declared disabled students answer yes to all of these questions. We want to see this increase. To us, it seems that the higher education sector lacks three things. Insight into the disabled student experience, knowledge of the standards to measure this experience against, and accountability. We try to provide all three things through our new website, accessinsights.co.uk. Today, we're releasing new pages on the website, allowing you to explore the statistics demonstrating the current disabled student experience, explore our 10 year goals, and to compare different universities against each other. The full 2023 report will be released in two weeks on November 29th. We hope that by making these resources available, we will encourage universities to improve their accessibility policies and encourage oversight bodies to enforce standards for the sector. Our project will run for 10 years, and I hope that when I return for the launch of Disability History Month 2033, I will be able to report an improved situation for disabled students in higher education. of our union, which is the National Education Union. It's the largest education union in Europe. He is a primary teacher who understands the importance of inclusive education. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, and um, it's really great to be with you uh, this evening, albeit a, a bit of a flying visit. Apologies for, for, for being late, and unfortunately I'm going to uh, have to leave shortly. Uh, it's a, a colleague's uh, retirement uh, today, after 32 years of service to our, to our union, they've been an absolute stalwart uh, in the fight for social justice for young people and of course their fight, the fight for disability rights has been uh, central to, 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 to that. So uh, unfortunately I can't be with you for the whole of this evening, but I'm really privileged to be here today. Um, you know, we are very much pleased to once again be hosting uh, this event and to support Disability uh, History Month. I'm going to talk a bit about um, disabled educators and the union's work with them and then I'll come and on to talking about uh, some of our work in advocating for, for disabled <coughs> students. But firstly I want to talk to you today about what the work the NEU is doing to build a more diverse uh, workforce which both recruits and retains uh, disabled teachers uh, and support staff. Now, as the follow-up to our, our win on this year's uh, uh, pay award, um, we're looking at ways that we can work with the government to reduce workload uh, for teachers. And whilst we know that uh, this will improve the well-being of all school and college staff, it will especially impact on disabled people, and we think uh, will help them keep stay in the profession. Um, the NEU's disabled members are represented on our executive by Colleen, uh, who I can see uh, there, who is a tireless campaigner alongside our members um, for, for, for improved uh, representation of rights and uh, make sure that our disabled voices are heard in the union and uh, belong, uh, beyond. We have produced a, a short film this term 
uh, with our disabled members where they talk about how important it is to be part of the union and to self-identify as disabled. So please just do look out for that on social media uh, this month. Um, the NEU with its disabled members has produced the Disability Equality Toolkit which includes information about the social model of disability uh, using appropriate language, the law and organising collectively to achieve disability equality and reasonable adjustments. Now the toolkit is being used in schools uh, by our members and our latest tool, the Reasonable Adjustment Passport and Policy has been um, widely, widely welcomed. Now all of the toolkit uh, resources are, avail uh, are available to download free from the NEU website. Um, building a, a strong movement of disabled educators confident to assert the rights of themselves and their students is essential to achieving the government's stated aim of a more inclusive education system in which most, <coughs> most children and young people are educated in mainstream schools. This is a real desire of mine to absolutely achieve. I've spent a long time teaching in special educational needs and absolutely fundamentally believe that should resources school be adequately resources, properly funded, uh, most of our students can thrive alongside uh, their, 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 their peers and that is something we must absolutely be fighting for. We are regularly engaging with the DfE and the SEND sector around the myriad of issues and new proposals coming out of the SEND and alternative provision uh, green paper and change plan. Removing uh, EHCPs, education and healthcare plans for young people who need additional support without first putting into place uh, schools, uh, the addition in schools the additional funding, staff and systems needed to provide that support is quite simply uh, unworkable and likely to be detriment to the progress of SEND young people. For the government's change programme to be effective there needs to be greater consideration of the mainstream, uh, of the issue of mainstream schools as they currently stand uh, not being appropriate for many uh, students with SEND. Therefore, rather than removing the EHCPs and expecting young people to fit into the current systems with classroom staff picking up the pieces, the focus should be on making a school system which is inclusive and fit for the purpose of educating all young people. And this requires a number of things, including a more flexible uh, curriculum, keeping experienced school staff in the classroom, increased capacity of pastoral teams in schools, um, timely access to specialist external support from EP, speech and language therapists and <coughs> CAMs, um, but also meaningful initial teacher training in SEND and ongoing CPD, which allows professional discussion, something that has been widely uh, neglected by this government. In short, building inclusion requires investment in terms of funding, time for staff to do their jobs properly and changing the overall culture of education. It's going to be no easy feat, but given the government's current direction of travel to focus on uh, disability, um, childhood and due for this year's UK Disability History Month, it is so pertinent. With the government SEN and disability policy being directly, directed largely towards saving money, rather than providing what young people need to thrive in an inclusive education system, putting the emphasis back onto the young people and empowering them to advocate for themselves is crucial. So going forward um, at the NEU we um, see that success is creating a more inclusive system which will only be achieved through building alliances across the sector between schools, colleges, local authorities and of course Families. The government wants to divide our sector, pitting families' interests, uh, families against schools and local authorities to deflect from their own in inadequacies. We want to work with the sector to oppose the funding cuts, replace Ofsted, review the current uh, curriculum offer and build a more inclusive education system in which students are valued and in which all students can thrive. So thank you very much. 
for inviting me to speak and I wish you every success with UK Disability uh, History Month in 2023 and your continued campaigning for inclusion. Is now is a post is a disabled student at UCL and she's going to come up. Uh, hello everyone. My name is Susanna and uh, it is really my pleasure to be here with you all today as we mark uh, the start of Disability History Month this year. So a little bit about me. I wear many hats, um, but all of my work is around disability rights, particularly around youth and education. I work with Disabled Students UK with Meta as a um, campaign assistant. Uh, I also work with the Commonwealth Youth Council as their disability rights advocacy lead, with um, the education charity Their World, which is funded by Sarah Brown as a global youth ambassador, where I um, advocate for more national and international investments in accessible and quality early years education. But I am speaking to you today as a disabled student and a disabled student officer at University College London. Um, UCL is one of the largest universities um, in the UK and our population of disabled students is quite sizable. As of this academic year, nearly 16% or over 7,000 students at UCL have declared having one or more disabilities. Well, UCL has a history of being a progressive um, institution and making higher education accessible to underrepresented groups. Equal access for the, um, its current and prospective students with disabilities remain an evident issue. A report from our Disabled Students Network in 2019 found that 67% of respondents reported experiencing ableism at the university. I have listed some issues disabled students have come forward with and these can be broadly categorized into physical, structural and attitudinal issues but I actually won't go into them um, in detail since I want to focus on the things um, disabled students and staff groups have been calling for UCL to improve a lot. And some of these include making accessibility an institutional priority by recognizing that improvements benefits all students and staff, more proactively engage with disabled students and collaborate with them on making changes. This is especially important as many disabled students have reported losing trust in the system because their previous feedback, including the DSM report in 2019, have not really resulted in any substantial changes. Review existing protocols and systems to better coordinate adjustment and support processes between the central disability support team and individual departments, um, especially for larger institutions like UCL. Uh, enforce compliance to reasonable adjustments and set up efficient complaint procedures to hold ableism accountable. Make more centralized efforts to teach disability awareness and equality for all students and staff. This is particularly important for me because from my personal experience of um, holding and also participating in these events, most of our attendees are other disabled students and disabled staff, but we are not really the main target audience here. Um, disability equality needs to be taught to non-disabled students and staff as well um, to make the campus culture more inclusive. A specific example I can give is UCL's eugenics uh, legacy education project which aims to recognize its institutional history with eugenics um, and educate people on the historical and current implications of eugenics on disabled and other minority populations. But an issue I think with this project and other efforts by UCL to, um, and UCL's disability related projects is that um, it is too non-compulsory for everyone um, so, meaning that the materials, the podcasts, the um, anything they are trying to teach are only um, reaching the people who are already interested or involved in the topic, and that is mostly other disabled students and staff. So, I think UCL and all institutions need to make more uh, need to do more to make sure disability equality and awareness actually reaches everyone. 
and UCL as a large and growing institution desperately needs to expand on its disability support team and increase funding on this department. All disabled students acknowledge that disability-facing staff are doing the best that they can, but they just do not have the capacity to even meet the basic accessibility needs of all disabled students. But UCL should also hire more disabled staff in general. This year, 7% of UCL staff have declared disability, but 23% of the UK working age adults are disabled. Um, disabled staff are more comfortable working with disabled students, and their presence in the workplace also helps to push for a more inclusive campus and workplace culture, and make sure accessibility stays on top of everyone's agenda. But I want to end on a more positive note. Uh, the theme for Disability History Month this year is Disability Children and Youth, and I think it is really important for us to recognize and encourage the incredible efforts by um, disabled and non-disabled young people in leading disability change. Um, at UCL, we have medical students who are working to challenge um, the language used to describe disability in the curriculum, which is quite important as we're trying to move away from the medical model. We have voluntary assisted technology project led by students, existing disabled students who are more mentoring freshers uh, and new disabled students, and peer support and advocacy networks like the Disabled Students Network, Autism Society, but also in, uh, national ones like Disabled Students UK. I think all institutions and just everyone in general should do, um, do more to spotlight and acknowledge these incredible young people-led initiatives. So these are some of the things I have experienced and learned as a disabled student and disabled students officer at UCL. I hope that these reflections on one of the largest um, universities in the UK can help inform some current challenges and potential solutions for the higher education sector in general when it comes to accessibility. Um, according to data collected by the government in 2021, disabled students um, in higher education have increased, but um, they are found to be more likely to drop out, and those who finish the degrees tend to have lower results. So I hope we can work together and also harder to um, change that during and after this month. Thank you. Uh, we've now got a film by Yewande Akintelu Oronayi. She's the young person lead at the Alliance for Inclusive Education. My name is Yewande. I am 31 years old and I have cerebral palsy. Growing up as a disabled person from the age of three, going to nursery school, I knew I just, I wanted to be just like everyone else. I always wanted to do well academically at school and have a tight knit group of friends. Coming from an immigrant family, academics is very important. I knew I was different to everyone else when I couldn't run around like the other children and partake in the same games and physical activities. Children would ask me questions such as, why can't you walk? Why are you using a buggy? I used a buggy until the age of six before I got my first wheelchair. I used to use a walker in primary school called a K walker. I would sit on the back when I was tired and kids would whiz and push me around on it. I felt free and part of something for a bit. I noticed that kids wouldn't hang out with me at lunch times and at break times. I had learning support assistants, but they restricted me from making connections and friendships. Many of the support assistants were ableist and they didn't have any clue about disability rights. Looking back now, of course, I knew this was discrimination, but when you're that young, you don't have the words to describe it. There were small examples of inclusive practice in primary school, but it still wasn't good enough, I think, 
academically and socially. I was excluded from certain school trips due to accessibility and there wasn't enough academic support in my weaker subjects, such as maths. Secondary school, the lack of inclusion increased and it became more of the same. They just expected inclusive education to happen and they didn't really work towards it. I enjoyed subjects such as English throughout my childhood and I felt supported when the teacher was encouraging. I found solace in impairment groups with other children and young people with the same impairment as I have and also when I went to physio groups but I was still left wanting more and wanting them to tackle the discrimination that I experienced. My mum has always been and was always very supportive of me as a disabled person, even though we didn't use disability rights language at home because we weren't familiar with the movement then. She never allowed me to feel ashamed or embarrassed of myself as a disabled person. This came from people at school I experienced bullying in secondary school. I also experienced comments from other people, such as in the society and the community. It was difficult at school trying to make friends. However, I know that I was privileged to attend mainstream education and get qualifications even though it wasn't a fully inclusive experience. I also know that I was privileged to get to go to university. It wasn't until I was about to turn 20 years old that I discovered the disabled people's movement and I started to understand about barriers and my identity as a disabled person. It changed my whole life. I understood that the discrimination that I had been facing was not my fault. I was able to identify with other young people who were experiencing the same barriers, but it was different in the sense that I interacted with young people from various impairment groups, which was new for me. I still felt somewhat left out, usually being the only black pers disabled person at disability rights events. And also coming from an immigrant Christian family, I couldn't always see all aspects of my identity reflected, even before the disability rights movement and when I was a child. That's why joining somewhere like Alfie's Disabled Black Lives Matter group has been so helpful. I've been able to meet other people that understand my experience as a black disabled person. I would say to any disabled young person who's growing up and struggling with their identity, anything that you're experiencing now is not your fault. The world has just not woken up to how amazing you are. I and many others will keep fighting for you so that we get closer to an equal world for you. But until then, keep believing in yourself. Things will get better. Be proud of who you are. And tell me, you Andy, you are now working, I think. Tell us about your first paid job. So in January 2023, I was able to be successful in getting my first paid job. So I work for the Alliance for Inclusive Education. I was a volunteer there for many, many years. But this January, I started leading a project called the Our Voice Project. So I'm the Our Voice Youth Officer. 
So the Our Voice project, what we are trying to do is bring disabled young people together and we want to hear from them about what makes them angry, what matters to them and the barriers that they are facing. We want disabled young people to be developed in their campaign skills around inclusive education and we want them to develop their political capacity as well. Thank you very much. Okay, now we, we have some excerpts from Exploration 2023. We had Lucas at the beginning reading his poem about autism, and we've got a few others. Yeah, we put this out when we had a pre-launch in March. We didn't get a huge take-up, but we've got some good things here that we're going to share. So these are from uh, Igberg Special School in Hackney, and uh, I did some work there with, with it. And what was interesting is that as 102 pupils and about 102 staff there, and uh, none of the students seem to know the word disability or that they were disabled young people. So we did some work to raise consciousness on that uh, with the staff and the pupils. And these are some of their creative things that came out of that. They did some work on identifying barriers as well. This is a dance company uh, that put this piece together, Magpie, uh, who are in Bromley. See me. What makes me who I am? Strong. Feel sad.
I feel invisible. The change I want to see. I want to see change. I want to see focus. I want you to see me. Fellows on live radio in Cornwall. Okay, welcome to our first broadcast. We are the Adequacy Fellows, heroes waiting for and empowering young adults with a learning disability. This month is a Disability Awareness Month. And this will be for our first focus for our first forecast. Over to Francesca. Thank you, Jack. Disability History Month focuses on the experiences of disablement amongst people in the past, now, and what needs to change for the future. You are absolutely right. Yes. Social inclusion due to stigma, stereotypes, negative attitudes, and socially created barriers or issue that people with a learning disability experience. We want barriers removed and our differences valued. Absolutely. We do want them removed. We wanted to know more from our fans about their experiences, so we asked them three questions. Jack? Yes, and these questions are, they were, what did you enjoy about your life the most? What is not good about having a disability? And if you had a magic wand, what would you do to make your life even better? My name is Aidan, and what I like doing is surfing because it's with friends and a community. And what I don't like about having a disability is it's sometimes hard to do stuff. And if I had a magic wand, I would make myself a millionaire. I'm Ashley, and what I enjoy the most is spending time with my friends and hanging out with them. Uh... What is not good about my having a disability is that I get frustrated and stressed about certain things. And if I had a magic wand to make my life better is have more support to be able to do more things that I want to do. Hello, my name is Francesca and my uh, well, what I enjoy is um, my life because I do very exciting events coming up every year. What I'm not so good about having this disability is I struggle with my mobility skills because I have to use my inner cells and my trainers to help my hips while I'm walking and if I have a magic wand I would I, I do enjoy uh, doing busy things every year but there is one thing left to change is my hips because I want my inner cells to make my hips even better with my walking also if I don't wear my inner cells while I in my shoes, while I'm still walking, my hips will hurt. Thank you. I am Jack Thomas, as you can tell by my Time to Shine badge. 
And what I enjoy about this is hanging out and working as a team with my friends. What is not good about disability is having seizures. I don't like that. If I had a magic wand, I would make my seizures go away and spend more time with friends and hanging out with my friends. Hello, my name is Jamie. And the one thing I like is spending time with my friend. And the thing I don't like about about the disability is I can't read and I'd have frustration. And I like to talk clearer. And if I have magic wand, it'd be a body with muscle and to talk clearly. My name is Melissa. Going out on holiday to Disney and concerts, not going out on my own, need to wait for adults. Other people need to be patient and understand disability. Hi, uh, my name is Siobhan and what I like about my life is I like going out shopping. I am funny. I got activities. I go to all for Cornwall and then seeing my dogs. I collect toys. What is not good is sleeping issues and topics and don't like people staring at me. I need understanding what it means. Not everyone understands disabilities. If I had a magic wand, I'll be able to improve the understanding of the disabilities. is Jonathan Bryan who founded I Can Talk. He's a school student and there's a film. My name is Jonathan and I am 17 years old. Since I shared some of my journey for Disability History Month in 2020, I have experienced both good and less good educational side effects of the pandemic and lockdowns. One of the main advantages has been an increased openness amongst the general population for running events, meetings and training online. For me, this has meant that I can talk at ministerial roundtable from a room at school, present to Dundee University students in the morning, Chichester University students in the afternoon and meet with other Diana Award changemakers from around the world. However, there is nothing like meeting in person, and here, my experience of education and life has been rather more patchy. The issue comes when, in order to accommodate and include disabled people, there is a need to adapt and think outside of the box. This involves effort, and ultimately, an attitude that inclusion is worth it that we are worth it. Policy can be dictated by governments and organisations, but how that is interpreted is often down to individuals being determined to make a difference. The biggest factor in changing attitudes is in individuals' interpretation, and often this lies in people seeing the value in inclusion. Here is where I see a great opportunity for disabled and young people to flip the narrative from being talked about to having our voices heard and understood. We need increased platforms to share our stories, not to be inspirational, but to show the world how much richer life is when we are a true part of it. That is why at Teach Us Too, 
We are keen to share the stories of children and young people whose lives have been transformed by the introduction of literacy teaching, enabling them to share their experiences of life in their own words. For children and young people who are non-speaking, the ability to write even basic words gives them the ability to say anything they want in their own words. It is life-changing and life-giving. But for many non-speaking pupils, particularly those labelled like Jonathan was, with profound and multiple learning difficulties, being taught literacy does not happen at school. Why? Government policy has recently introduced the engagement scale. The engagement model is an assessment tool to help schools support pupils who are working below the level of the national curriculum and not engaged in subject-specific study. Many schools are interpreting it as a licence to only give a sensory curriculum to classrooms of pupils labelled with PMLD. But the issue facing these young people goes deeper than this. It comes back to assumptions made about disability and what is possible. The least dangerous assumption is the notion that if we aren't 100% sure, we should make decisions that, if wrong, have the fewest negative repercussions against the person. In this scenario, which is the least dangerous assumption? We assumed he could learn, so we gave him every opportunity, and it turns out he couldn't. Or, we assumed he could not learn, so we did not give him the opportunity, but it turns out he could learn. Teaching literacy skills is the single most powerful thing we can do for individuals who require AAC. As a charity, we know that teaching literacy to complex learners is not easy. It requires reflective teachers who can be flexible and adapt approaches. It's why we sponsor courses by experts in the field like Marion Stanton and Dr Sarah Mosley, to equip teachers with adaptive, personalised approaches and to give teachers the resources and ideas they need to implement literacy in the classroom for all learners. We started with Jonathan's words and we should end with them too for listening to what young disabled people say should be at the heart of all we do. This poem sums up Thinking out of the box. You can't include me, so don't ever pretend my contribution is valuable and that society is richer in diversity because I know my disability is awkward to accommodate. It is too much trouble. I bring nothing but hassle. I won't believe a can-do attitude can change anything. This is a reverse poem. I will now read it from the bottom line up. A can-do attitude can change anything. I won't believe I bring nothing but hassle. It is too much trouble. My disability is awkward to accommodate. Because I know society is richer in diversity and that my contribution is valuable. So don't ever pretend that you can't include me. We'll carry on with Richard. He's, he's going to speak next. He's founder of UK Disability History Month, which he founded in our kitchen 14 years ago. And he's the General Secretary of the Commonwealth Disabled People's Forum and he runs World of Inclusion amongst many other things. Thank you, Susan. Okay, so I think, I'm sorry about the last two we didn't get. They will all be uh, out and up on the website in about a week in a full film of all of this event. And the individual films we'll put up separately before the full film comes out so people can actually see those. Because I think what Jonathan would have said uh, just to paraphrase, that you know, he was sitting in a PMLD school and that what is now challenging ministers on 
the standards of uh, assessment which allow schools to say these children can't be taught to read, can't be taught to write. They're just going to have a sensory curriculum for their 17 years in special school. And this is terrible and has come from some people who are anti-children as far as I can see and are wanting to take us back to something I'll talk about in a minute that there is only fixed potential in various individuals, which is effectively a eugenicist position. And Jonathan showed very clearly how that can be challenged through facilitated communication, eye-pointing on a board. He learned to, he showed the world that he could read and write and has gone now into mainstream school and is in the sixth form of his mainstream school, doing his A-levels at the moment at 17. Uh, which proves that those who believe those things are wrong, but they have the ear of government, and he's been busy trying to challenge the government on that. So his two films about that, one challenging the government and one he made for us, uh, asking all teachers to actually learn about how to bring about facilitated communication for many of those children who have these labels is important. I'll come back to that, but I, it was an important point leading to what I wanted to say. We started, the broadsheet you've got, which has got much more of these in, it's also electronically available on the website, and there's a lot of material that I'm going to mention here, which is in much more detail on the website. But I thought we'd start with the Children Commissioner's Survey of Disabled Children in England, because people say, well, what do disabled young people want? Well, she did a, a representative sample of 3,591 disabled young people between 8 and 17. So I don't think people can actually challenge what they're saying. And what they're saying is they want to be understood, seen and heard, to benefit from a fantastic, ambitious education in mainstream school where possible and support at school when they need it, for all activities and services to be accessible, to receive high quality care uh, locally and quickly, to be free from harassment and discrimination, and for tra uh, transitions to be smooth and prepare them for adulthood. And for services to be seen, uh, to see them as part of the family and take a whole family approach. Not too much to ask, but we're a million miles away from that despite lots of pieces of legislation and more money being spent in this area than ever before. Unfortunately, it's not being spent in the right way, and that's the problem. So we need to go back a bit to understand why some of these attitudes are so pernicious and how they last so long in particularly education but also in social services and elsewhere. First picture up there is children working in the mills and factories at the beginning of the 19th century. It was common for children, uh, initially they said they had to be uh, over seven, which isn't very old to go and work in a factory, uh, and then it went up to uh, that they couldn't work at weekends and then eventually after several parliamentary committees it was that they shouldn't work in factories at all until they were 11 which was a great step forward and then later on it got to an age. People may look askance at this but there are people in our political system at the moment who want to get rid of human rights, you've been hearing them today on the radio, one of the essential parts of the human rights that were established in this country was the right to safety at work, the right for children not to labour. Is it that the people who want to get rid of the European uh, Human Rights Act want to go back to these days? I'm not sure. Maybe they do. But we need to be very careful. Because many, many of those dis uh, children became disabled through working in the mills, became deaf by the machinery that they were working alongside. So this was a cause of disablement, actually forcing children to work in uh, these factories. A little later in the century, as more and more people left the country, forced out of the country, often by the Enclosures Act and getting rid of common land, to meet the huge demand that was being created by the Industrial Revolution. But it became clear after a recession, after the Napoleonic Wars, that there had to be the right type of workers, and more and more, what had been family working in the fields and in the early uh, handloom weaving and so on was no longer the case. Now human beings had to be adjuncts to the machines and lots of people were cast to one side. Now before that, after the abolition of the monasteries 500 years before, Henry VIII, etc., 
who had provided the care for the community, there were beggars wandering the streets, including children. And so the Elizabethan Poor Law came in, but it was more liberal than what came in in the 19th century, because it meant that the parish would support you by taking their collection on Sundays. It was a local tax. After 1834, they thought that would be allowing people who were shirkers to live the life of, the life of Riley, as they put it, uh, and instead, if they wanted to have uh, benefits, the level had to be below the level of the lowest pay level, and it had to be really harsh. So they thought this would discourage the shirkers who should be working in the factories, but actually what happened, by only five years after this, there were already 200 new model workhouses built, and of course, disabled people ended up there because there was no other subsistence. So by 1860, 60% of the inhabitants of the workhouse were disabled people, and there were large numbers of children there as well. Ironically, they became the first poor and working class children who got an education. So we had the ragged schools that were actually set up alongside the workhouses, and if you weren't in poverty, but just not really doing very well in the city, you didn't get a state education if your parents were uh, your parents couldn't afford it, you've got nothing. So the children in the workhouse were actually better educated sometimes. But many of the others who were vagrants on the street, and remember there were huge numbers of causes of impairment in the late 19th century. It was a very rough place, there were lots of diseases, cholera was very common, uh, wagons and so on were often running out of people's feet, it was a very dangerous place out on the street, and Dr. Bernardo, who was an Irish man who wanted to uh, study medicine, saw all these children around and said, well, I better do something about this. And he set up a charitable trust to bring them in in East London. And what was interesting, unlike many of the charities at that time, he said, I want the disabled and the non-disabled children in. I'm going to take them all together. So Bernardo's was one of the first inclusive uh, approaches that came along. And here we see one of the young girls who was uh, uh, with, a, with crutches, who was brought in, and when it may later on have been that he had his own child with Down syndrome and he had a, an approach to that as well. However, there was strict segregation in many areas as we move into the 20th century. In 1880, uh, people who were eugenicists, I'll be talking about on the next slide, banned international sign language. They stopped deaf people learning sign language because they were worried that they would get together and form a group of their own that would outbreed hearing people. Sounds a bit ridiculous, but that's what they thought. And so for a hundred years, deaf people were not allowed to be taught in their own first language, apart from the Galladay brothers in the United States, who managed to keep fighting for it. And it's probably not an accident. The only university for deaf people in the world, Galladay University, has their name because they kept that tradition going. Here, segregation, boys and girls were not allowed to mix and they had to mark on either side. And here, another one in the 1930s, Halliwick School for Crippled Girls. And this was more and more, as we see from out of sight, a oral history book of the first part of the 20th century. More and more people went around and pulled children in and said they shouldn't be going to the ordinary school, they have to go to these separate special schools. So that was what was going on. But one of the things that drove this more than anything else was eugenics, which really came out of Darwin's cousin, uh, Galton, taking this on and saying we need to take Darwin's theory, survival of the fittest, and we need to put it onto human society. And that's what they began to do. Just a few influential people like Mary Dendy, who you see up here, who was active in Manchester, and she got an obsession. Uh, many people would have seen her as one of the good people who did things for the poor unfortunate. But she did more than that. She went around Manchester schools, and she identified large numbers of children in Manchester who shouldn't be mixing with other children because they were idiots, imbeciles, and feeble-minded. And she agitated with a number of other people. There was a, a, a reverend down in Bristol who set up certain other things earlier than there was any legislation, and they set up their own segregated provision. Hers was Sandal Bridge in Cheshire. There are now nice estates there. 
were, there were a whole number of segregated schools and hospitals that she set up there. And they campaigned for, in the 1890s, a royal commission which took a lot of false evidence from a lot of false science uh, and convinced people, such as Churchill, who was the Home Secretary, that. Uh, uh, I've got to get my glasses out here. Um, the unnatural and increasingly rapid growth of the feeble minded and insane classes coupled as it is with the steady restriction amongst all the thrifty, energetic, superior stock constitutes a national and race danger which it is impossible to exaggerate. That was in a letter to Herbert Asquith, the Prime Minister. There was first of all a, mo a, amendment, a motion that went to Parliament for sterilisation of all of these people. That was defeated by the Catholics and Josiah Wedgwood, not Josiah, Josiah's grandson, Wedgwood, MP. But nevertheless, the Mental Deficiency Act came in, in 1913. And this set up a new structure, which really only started after the First World War, of a whole series of uh, institutions, long stay institutions, which included schools, but of course, children were deemed ineducable. And there's a certificate here for a young woman, who was in one of these schools, and it says uh, she is uh, incapable of following the curriculum and is indeed an imbecile. So this language was used and continued through the 44 Act, which was meant to be a reforming act, but nothing changed. So there was a whole group of children, about 80,000 in England, who were deemed ineducable. And this went on until 1973, which isn't that long ago. It was 50 years ago. We are, in fact, on the anniversary of the implementation of the 1970 Act, which came in, which said to local authorities, all children are deemed to be eligible, and local authorities should stop having training establishments, which is what they had instead of schools. So what actually happened was on one day, I think it was September, 73, the label junior training establishment came down and SLD, PMLD school went up. Nothing else changed. And as you can see in this growth of special schools, there's a big jump here between 1960, uh, 1967 and 1977. <coughs> and that was because those ineducable children were brought into the segregated system. But it's a shame, is it not, that throughout this last 120, 130 years, there has been a growth, a steady growth, in the numbers of children who it is deemed cannot be educated with their peers in mainstream schools. And I have to say, it is a great shock that in the statistics for this very year, there are 191,000 children now not in education with their peers, but instead in segregated schools. There was a period after the Labour government in uh, 97 to 2003, 4 where Plateau was beginning to drop. But even the Labour government dropped their ideas about inclusion after David Blunkett had pushed it through, and others said, no, 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 like Lord Adonis. We have no policy on inclusion by, by 2008, you could tell the select committee. And of course they didn't, because they were obsessed with the literacy hour, the numeracy hour, and lead tables about achievement for some children, but not all. And so they introduced the measures which this current government have actually built on to mean the segregation of the children on this, most of the children on this slide you can see experienced, although there were some examples, many in many ways, of, of schools being inclusive, in that period of the 80s and 90s uh, and through to the noughties, but that wasn't to hold sway. Okay. Um, so we know inclusion works, we've got lots of evidence about it. I did a survey for the government in 2003-04 of inclusive schools and we sent a questionnaire out to 10,000 mainstream schools, which is nearly half of them, and we wanted examples of inclusive education 
that those schools were doing, and 550 schools said yes, and all the different categories of disabled children, we as a mainstream school are including them. And these things that are up there on the board, a can-do attitude, uh, involving students in their education, uh, sensitive approach, there was a whole series of things, you can read them up there, that we found, talking to the head teachers of all of those schools, that they were doing. So we had a sample based on a much larger group. We actually went around and filmed in 41 of those schools. It's still on my website, and you can buy it at the stationery office, the Reasonable Adjustment Project, but nobody seems to know anything about it these days. We have to reinvent the wheel, because uh, government thinks not inclusion is a good idea, but exclusion costs too much, because they are spending 10.5 billion now on sending kids out of mainstream schools. So they're beginning to reverse it, but they're doing it from the wrong end. Because as Daniel said, and I support the things he was saying, we need to train our teachers. We need to develop pedagogy. We need a person-centered approach, such as has been developed here by two ex-special school heads and our psychologists who are run inclusive education. And these tools are widely used all around the world, and yet we are not using them anymore. For instance, under the last Labour government, we were working for emotional intelligence, and Southampton and Portsmouth developed whole methods of doing that. But it was all now being pushed out of the way by the obsession for meritocracy to sieve off the best that can use our alter system and the rest don't. Perhaps 35% of kids not really achieving anything, many being excluded for the most ridiculous things. And, uh, of course, the method of that is the introduction of academy schools. So there is much to be fought for and much to be changed. And of course, the government is party to a UN convention that says that they should be developing a plan for inclusive education, except they're not. Uh, so what should we be doing in light of what we've heard today and in light of what everything else we've heard uh, from these speakers? Well, we need to get rid of normal. What is normal? We need to value difference. We need to value each other. And I think many of those, particularly those dancers and other young people who represented to us, that's what they want. They want to be accepted for who they are. So I think that's the first thing we need to do. We need to remove the barriers for full access and communication. And really, out of those eugenicists who fought hard to segregate people. There was one man in particular, Sir Cyril Burt, who was first professor of eugenics at University College, we've heard about University College, uh, who was also a consultant psychologist for the London County Council. And when the London County Council was shut in the form of ILEA, there were more special segregated schools in London, inner London, than anywhere else in the country. That was his legacy. But he had a wider legacy. He was on the Spen Committee in the 1930s that looked at what should happen after the war for an education system for secondary children as well as primary. And he said we would have to measure their intelligence at 11. It was called the 11 plus. So that was introduced. And we are still doing that with the SATs. We're still measuring a very narrow band of intelligence and our education system is run on eugenicist lines and it needs to be challenged as a human rights abuse the way that it is actually working. So the third thing we need to do is enforce disability equality law. There is law for zero discrimination and harassment in all our schools and colleges. You wouldn't know it from the amount of bullying and harassment that takes place, the amount of bullying and harassment which often leads to exclusion, it, with ridiculous behaviour policies, zero tolerance behaviour policies, that for instance an autistic person or someone who's ADHD can't sit still all day and they're being punished for that. So that is outrageous and we need to see the law being enforced much more. Challenging, uh, challenging disability hate crime and bullying. And we can only do this by involving all those students in every college, and I'm pleased to hear what you said about what you think should happen with awareness raising for all students at university, but we shouldn't be needing to do that. We should be doing it from the nursery upwards, 
so that all disabled young people are welcome where they are and all non-disabled young people understand why they should treat them with respect. So we need to support our independent living so that large numbers of disabled young people are not living when they don't really want to be at home with their parents but are actually being supported to be with their peers and living in the community and like uh, Ellen actually marrying and having her own household which is exactly what everyone else thinks they might be able to do whether they marry or not is another matter but living with someone that's what everybody should be able to do if they want to uh, so meaningful and adequate livelihoods it is a fact that people with learning difficulties significant learning difficulties only five percent of them are in painful employment so why are we spending large amounts of money on special schools which don't educate them and also lead to them having no livelihood for the rest of their life so everybody else is paying for it. That's ridiculous. And it is a, an effect of the way that these ideas operate in our society. We need to empower disabled children and young people and their peers to challenge oppression when they see it. And they do see it. And I've worked with many thousands of children in classes and they certainly see it and if you give them their head and say, well, what, what should be the rules of our class here? They'll come up with a very humanistic, humanitarian approach to each other. It's the imposition of those who are seeking to make money out of the education system or climb up the lead table uh, factory farming of education that is the problem. And that, of course, comes from the top. And I'm sad to see that we have Mr. Cameron back in the government in a senior post because it was he and he more than anyone else in the coalition government who actually brought in a policy that the whole of the Lib Dems and the Conservatives adopted of there being a bias towards inclusion in the system and he was against the bias to inclusion. So what that growth that you saw on the graph there, one person responsible, David Cameron and his government. And we have to reverse that and we have to convince Keir and others in waiting to take over that this is the way forward. Not business as usual, which currently they're saying, but they have to bring about a real change. And lastly, we need to recruit parents particularly who believe too many of the lies that are being told by schools, that their child will never achieve anything, they can't do anything. And if you'd have seen Jonathan's film, you would have had proof beyond any doubt that every child can actually achieve at their own level. And it was psychologists who in 1973, and this is my last point, said, we don't believe there is a fixed intelligence potential in children. We believe all children can develop if they are educated in the right environment and supported. And it was those psychologists who pushed for the 17th Act, which led to the idea that no child is ineligible. That was a major leap forward 50 years ago. We need a new leap forward now so that all children are included and can become part of the community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming.